Three, two, one. Okay. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Politics and Prose Live. My name is Leah. I'm a children's and teen bookseller who has the honor of being your host today. Thank you so much for joining us in this new format where we continue to bring awesome authors and their new books to readers like you. Since this is a new adventure for us, please bear with us as we work out all the kinks and get comfortable. We are so excited to have these two very special guests today, Victoria Jamison and Omar Mohammed. In just a few moments, they're going to begin their chat. If you have a question for Victoria or Omar, you can click on the Ask a Question button at the bottom of your screen and add one there. You can also vote for your favorite questions and at the end, our guests will have time to answer some. You can also click the shining green purchase button below to get your own copy of When Stars Are Scattered. We have free shipping through tomorrow, April 15th. And if you're a student joining us today, please check with an adult before buying anything. And lastly, don't worry about turning off your webcams or mics for our event. You can see us, but we can't see you. So get comfortable and enjoy the discussion. So now on to the event you're waiting for. It is my pleasure to introduce these two special guests. Best-selling and award-winning author and illustrator Victoria Jameson has written numerous bright and engaging children's books, including her popular graphic novels, All's Fair in Middle School and the Newbery Honor-winning Roller Girl. Today, we are celebrating the book birthday of her newest title, When Stars Are Scattered, which she co-wrote with fellow guest Omar Mohammed to bring his amazing and insightful story to all of you readers. Which brings us to our other awesome guest today, Omar Mohammed. Omar spent his childhood in the Dadaab refugee camp in Kenya. The new book, When Stars Are Scattered, beautifully presents Omar's experiences during this time. He is the founder of Refugee Strong, a project that empowers students living in refugee camps. And he currently works at a center helping refugees get resettled. It is my honor to introduce Victoria Jamison and Omar Mohammed. Take it away. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thanks for having us. Uh, I'm gonna start it off. Um, so thanks for having us, Politics and Prose. We were supposed to be there with you in DC. So I made a little, a little sign to pretend like we're there. Um, but I'm so thrilled to be here discussing our book, When Stars Are Scattered. So just to give you a little background, it's a graphic novel. Uh, full color with colors by Aman Getty. Hi, Aman, if you're watching. Um, and it highlights um, Omar and Hassan's life. Um, Omar is the older brother, Hassan's his younger brother. So, Omar, do you want to start us off and tell us about what life was like for you and Hassan in Dadaab? Wonderful. Thank you very much, Vicky. And also thanks to uh, Politics and Rose. And also thanks for, uh, to all those who are tuning in. Special thanks to Man Gedi too, the colorist who did this wonderful uh, job, and also the pink, uh, the publishers as well, and all those wonderful people that put a lot of work into this book. Uh, my name is Omar Muhammad, and I was born in Somalia, and then I grew up in a refugee camp in Kenya called the Dab Refugee Camp. When I was I were, when I was born, I was like any other child like you. I didn't know what's gonna happen after four years of my birth. I didn't know what's gonna happen in 10 years of my time as, as no one knows. And then God forbid, there was a civil law in my country. The circumstances then forced me to flee from my mother count, my motherland, that's what we call in, in my country to a refugee camp in Kenya. Before I proceed in that fleeing from your country to, a, uh, to, to the neighboring country as a refugee, or to another country not closer to your refugee, it's not, it's not something like any human being wants to do of any type. Because for me, I was what you guys call a middle class family. I needed nothing. My, my father was a farmer. My mother was a businesswoman in the market. I needed nothing but the circumstances. That's why in the book I said, no one chooses to be a refugee. The circumstances makes those refugees to be a refugee. So this book specifically talks about me, my younger brother Hassan, who has intellectual disabilities, my, uh, my adopted mom Fatuma, who also raised us in a refugee camp. 
When we fled from our country, we came to if if our refugee camp would is part of uh, the Dab refugee camp at Elijah. The UNHCR, United Nations Higher Refugee for uh, Service, were planning to host about maybe 20,000, 30,000, but it became a home to over 300,000 refugees. Because of that number, everything became, became a limit. Food, there was never enough food in the refugee camp because of what the UN planned and how many people came up, came, came to the refugee camp. Uh, water was also not enough. Med medication, don't even mention. So me and my younger brother get separated from my mom and my father became the victim of the civil law in Somalia. Then we, when we came to the refugee camp, this wonderful mom uh, with, no, with, with no legal paper signed, with the help of the United Nations, offered us to be our foster mom. So we, we, we didn't live with her, we lived across her house. Which is which very close to her, but she was our mother. Growing up in a refugee camp is, is there's nothing I can compare to in life in reality, because everything there was never enough thing. For 17 years, I never had three meals a day. I only had one meal. If you have one full meal, then you are very lucky, and that's it. I never wear a, sh a shirt, pants, and shoes. If you can afford one, and I, I say many times, all the refugee kids in the refugee camp, if you wear one long shirt that goes up to your knee, that is enough. For me, then the school, the space was limited and the classes were overcrowded because they were like in one classroom, that's supposed to be 40 students. We were like 100 plus students. Food, the, uh, the United Nations does a food distribution twice a month or once a month, it, it, it depends. But most of the time it was tw tw twice a month or once, once a month. But the food they were given was most of the time was maize, uh, a little bit of oil, a little bit of, of borage and something of, the, of that sort. But it was never enough. The food they distributed because of the number of the refugees that came and the resources that were available to those refugees, it, it, it was, it was uh, never in, in half. But for me, then I have to choose. Should I stay with my younger brother who has intellectual disability, who needs, who, who, who he only has, who only has me, and who needs 99.9% .9 of my time, or should I think of my future and go to school? Then after, with the help of uh, uh, Tol Salan, whom you will see in, in the book, I was able to go to school. You know, that, is, that should not be a choice. Should I go to school or should I take care of my, my, my younger brother? It's not something that any child should face when they are 14 years old or they are 13 years old or, or, or when they are even younger than, younger than that age. But for me, it, it, it happened, but I'm very happy that I was able to overcome with the help of many wonderful uh, people that worked with those all non-profit organizations, including Judge World Service, that I currently work with, UNHCR, Care International, Save the Children, and many organizations that do uh, uh, such, in, such a wonderful job uh, uh, around, uh, around the world. In the refugee camp, we only had three options. For you to stay there and do nothing, in the refugee camp, there's no jobs, there's no employment. And the worst of all is now I realized when I became a parent, I think of those parents who are, their child is crying for food and they have nothing to give. In, in the refugee camp, they have nothing. Their child may cry, may cry as little uh, for something as small as milk or even water or even a biscuit. They can't give anything to, to those child. In the refugee camp, the three options is stay in the refugee camp for you to be resettled or to go back to your country if it is safe. For me, none, uh, uh, to go back was not, was not an option. To stay in the refugee camp was not an option because I have my brother who has intellectual disabilities and there was no, just nothing. So I was very fortunate for me to be chosen to be resettled uh, to the US. And everyone does get the opportunity to be resettled. I say that because a lot of people may say, oh, we, 
those refugees coming to this country or to that country, no. The most vulnerable, among the vulnerable, are selected in the resettlement process. And then all of them do not make up to the end. Only a few percent, one percent of the one percent that were selected only make it to the end. And we forget we human beings in the resettlement process. You will be interviewed. You will be screened, be screened, interviewed, be interviewed, and then medically checked. Imagine you are sharing your story, what you have been through to those strangers that you have never saw, that you never met. And then you will reshare again. And then you will reshare again, and then you will reshare again. At the end, some of those refugees may be declined after going through this process. Some of them, like me, who were very lucky, were able to come and be resettled. Uh, after going all this through those interviews, I was able to be resettled to the, to the United States. So I know the book is, the, 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 the many things that you can learn from this book is, the refugees are human beings like, like us, like you. It, you can be a refugee tomorrow. If not you, your children can be a refugee tomorrow. Who knows? Nobody. But the main reason I wrote this book was there's millions of stories of refugees, but my story is only one of those stories. The main reason I, sh I, wanted, I wanted to share this, my story with the rest of the world, the world, I wanted to tell the people the fact about who those refugees are and how they come to this country and where they are coming from and what kind of life they live. And not only that, what do they bring to this country, to the country that they are, they are resettled in? They are entrepreneurs, they are, they are uh, taxpayers, they are all this. So please uh, I'll, uh, help me to realize how, how, what we can do to make sure this book reaches as many people as, as possible, for only one reason. I am now a resettlement case manager at Church World Service, also community cultural navigator. And uh, one thing I always see and motivates me is the first day those refugees come, I see them. And then I see them after two years, what, what they turn to. So, and I will always be grateful and I'll always be thankful to those I know there's millions of them who work with refugees, but this is the problem I have. If we are silent, if we don't say nothing, when we hear about others who are not welcoming refugees talking about refugees, then we are, it's, we are, we are one of them, if you, if, if, if you don't say anything. For you children out there watching today, the money thing is that you learn from this book is never lose hope. I know you'll be bullied at school. You may fail one time in, in your exams, but never, never give hope. There's always a struggle, but there's always survival after a struggle. There's always challenges. And imagine you read my, my, my book and you'll see, oh, Omar went a lot of challenge, a lot of difficult. In the world out there, there are people who want, who want more difficult than me, more challenging than me. And the same applies to you. So you children out there, never give up hope and never lose hope. Work hard and believe in yourself. You can be whatever you want and you have this wonderful opportunity. In my time when I was growing up in the refugee camp, in one notebook, we wrote like in six subjects or five subjects in one book. So for you here in America, how many, how many, how many, which subject, how many subjects do you write in one notebook? One book. Look at the resources we have. The first time I typed a computer, I typed is when I came to America. So you, you don't know what you don't have until you don't have it. I know time is against us. So please ask questions if you have any questions. Again, I want to thank all uh, staff that work with refugees, specifically shout out to Judge World Service staff here in Lancaster. You guys are a wonderful team, led by a wonderful person. Her name is Sheila. Mr. Uh, Sheila. And she has been CWS Lancaster's office direction for over 30 years. I'm inspired by her. Why? She was never a refugee. None of her family are refugees. But still, 
volunteered herself, dedicated to herself to work with refugees. I also want to thank to uh, Becky Garfa for opening her house to me and Becky to do when we were writing this book, going to her house and meeting after what it did. And also you wonderful staff around and also any supporters, all refugee supporters. So thank you very much. And I will turn back to uh, uh, Vicky. Uh, thanks. So um, I just wanted to talk about a little bit about how I met Omar and how, like I'm pointing to you like you're sitting next to me, but you're not. Um, how we met and how I got involved with the project. So I began volunteering when I lived in Portland, Oregon, uh, just working with my local resettlement agency, just volunteering where I could, like meeting families at the airport. Um, and then my family moved to Pennsylvania and I wanted to continue volunteering in some way, but I wasn't sure how. So I went to Church World Service where Omar works. <laughs> and um, I already knew that I, I was hoping to do something with my background as a graphic novelist, but I wasn't sure what that would look like or how that would even work. So as it so happens, when I visited Church World Service, um, I met Omar and I learned that Omar, you were working on your adult memoir and he was looking for a co-author. And so I'd said that I can't write adult books. It's just not something I'm able to do, but I write children's books and would you be interested in collaborating on a children's book? So we sort of sat down to talk about what that would look like or if it would work for both of us. And we decided just to give it a try. So the way we started was I would come to Omar's office usually during lunch breaks or whenever he had time. And I would just take notes on what he was telling me. So I would take notes and do some drawings. And these would be very messy notes and messy drawings. It was just kind of a way for us to get to know each other and for me to get to know Omar's story. And I would make notes and then I'd have questions and then come back in two weeks or whenever and we'd talk about questions and, well, tell me about school, tell me about how you got food. These were all things I didn't know about. So we did that for a long time. Um, the next step for me as a graphic novelist was taking some of those stories and putting them in panel form. So I was already thinking in images and trying to make sense of what's the beginning of the story, what's the end. Um, it was kind of difficult because Omar, like you lived in the camp until you're around 18. So how did you how do you take 18 years of experience and make a book? So we decided to focus it on around the age of 11, 12. And there are some flashbacks to when Omar and Hassan are younger and some chapters when they're older. But mostly it's around that 11, 12 year old age. At some point, because this doesn't make sense to anybody but myself, I had to write it in a manuscript. So I write it in a manuscript, just like a normal Word document. And this made it easy to share with Omar so we could make sure the story was working and to share with our editor, Kate, who also read through it and told us what we can make better. The next step, and this is my favorite part of making a graphic novel, because writing is really hard. Uh, I always struggle with the writing, but drawing is fun. So the next step was doing sketches for those panels I'd worked out. So I kind of took that manuscript, broke it into panels and started doing the sketches. So the sketches now are still pretty rough. And the very final stage of making the art is when I take my sketches and on the back, I scribble all over with this blue pencil and I place it on my good paper. And then I press really hard with the pencil. So it kind of transfers the drawing to my good paper. So this is what the final art for the book looks like. If you look close, you can see that there's still blue lines underneath, but those kind of disappear when I scan it. I, show, I chose this page because I forgot to add all the characters so I could draw them on the margins and then add them later in Photoshop. But really I tried to get these ink drawings just as finished as I could. And I like to show this to kids because I don't use special equipment. I use paintbrushes and ink and pens. So you don't really need special tools to make a book. You have all the tools you need at home if you have paper and pencil to tell your story. And then the final step was I would scan these 
And then uh, I would send them to our colorist, Iman. Hi, Iman again. And she would add some colors. And there were um, there were lots of patterns in this book. So that was a big part of the job. And I'll show you what the final page looks like. So you notice one difference is that I do the drawings much bigger than the actual book. That's because there are lots of little details that would be really hard for me to draw if, if I drew it this tiny. But if I do it larger, then I can fit in all those details. So that's the comparison of the two. So the last thing I wanted to do um, before we move into some questions is I wanted to show you how I do my drawings. So one of the hard parts of doing this book was that for the first time I had to draw characters based on real people. And Omar didn't have any pictures of himself when he was a kid. So I had to kind of look at Omar now and decide how what he would look like as a kid. So I'm gonna show you how I do um, a simple drawing. And if you're an artist at home, you can try this yourself. Uh, you gotta try Omar. Yeah, <laughs> Let's see what I come up. Okay. So um, usually when I start any character, I start with simple shapes like the letter U. When I visit schools, I tell them that's how I start because it's a simple shape, like a Mr. Potato Head doll that you can then add eyes, nose, mouth on to make it look like the person. For most people, I then add an upside down letter U for a torso. And one of the next steps I do is a stick figure. So when I meet people, usually grown-ups, and I tell them I'm an artist, they usually say, oh, you're so lucky. I could never draw. I can only draw stick figures. But I draw stick figures all the time. They're very handy. So right now, this could be anybody. Like it's just, it's like a smiley face. It's just a stick figure. So when I go to draw someone who's a real person, I take a look at Omar, <laughs> maybe I erase the facial hair that's there. <laughs> but really, I keep it very simple. I think the simpler, the better, because then it's kind of universal. So Omar and I talked a lot about what his hair should look like in the book. Um, if you look at Omar and Hassan together, um, Hassan's hair makes a kind of V shape. So that was one way I could tell the brothers apart or have helped my viewers tell the brothers apart. Another way I did was with the help of Aman, um, Omar's always wearing something red, even though he goes through ages four through 17. So if you see a red shirt, that kind of helps show that it's Omar. And in the beginning, he's wearing this striped shirt. Uh, one thing kids tell me often is that they have a hard time drawing hands. So I usually draw a mitten like that. And then some fingers inside the mitten. That's an easy way to draw hands. There's a little, little life hack for you. I actually don't have a hard time drawing hands or I don't mind drawing hands. What I don't like drawing are feet, which is unfortunate, unfortunate because in this book, most of the time kids are wearing sandals or have no shoes on. So I had to draw a lot of feet. And feet are the worst. They're like hands, but so much more complicated. I don't know why. So I, at least I got lots of practice drawing feet. I really think that when you're an artist, it's a lot of just practicing to get better at drawing things. Nobody is perfect when they start out. It's really by making books that you get better. I would always forget which... Oh, let's see it. <laughs> Did you make one? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it looks awesome. <laughs> that's so cute. <laughs> that's right. That's right. We should have switched around. You should have been the, the illustrator for the book. Yeah, <laughs> you want to show um, the last page of the real photos? You said like how our difference is. Yeah. Yeah. This is how it looks like. Uh, that is Hassan. And that's me. Who is this? That's Hassan. And this is me. 
That's why Hassan's head has uh, some kind of, she said, love shaped. Yeah. Um, any any questions, Omar, before we move on to the questions from? No, no, actually, you know, the time is like, it's it's how many how many pages is the book? It's a lot. So two fifty six. Two fifty six. So it's a lot. But the only thing you have, uh, uh, the best thing about this book is a fact. It's not no one telling you what you want to hear or not. It's just what what it is. And this, uh, as I said before, and this is one of millions of, of stories of of refugees. It's only one story from one of the million stories that you may encounter. Okay, so Leah, I guess we're ready for questions from viewers. Yeah, thank you so much, Victoria and Omar. That was amazing. Thank you for sharing your story and your process. Um, but now we're gonna go on and check out some great questions. This is the question and answer part. Um, it's still time that you can use that button below to share a question or vote for ones that you see that you really want me, want them to answer. So our first question comes from Carolyn and she asks, can you share a favorite memory from working together in this book? You wanna start? Yeah. <laughs> The the most uh, you know uh, I am impressed by the hard work of Vicky. This was something I have zero experience about from my story, and what I knew about refugee fires. But writing a book, I had zero. But my favorite part was how she stayed on top of everything. So, and my favorite is the things was there was so many ways of uh, she tries to get hold of me if it is uh, is if she needs stuff. She can text me, call me. Uh, Facebook me, WhatsApp me, or come to my house, come to my office. Come. So I'm impressed by her, by her hard, by Vicky's hard work. I'm really, really impressed. And uh, you can you can tell by by this book, or also by her, the other books that 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 uh, she wrote. So I'm really, really impressed and enjoyed also working with Vicky. And uh, I have learned a lot, and it also it will also improve me as a person just working with her. No, thanks. Uh, I I think the same way. I think my favorite memories are just the time we got to spend together, and it's um it's funny because at first I feel like we didn't really know each other, and sometimes it was difficult because I'd have to ask you about difficult parts of your story. But then as we got to know each other, and especially as the book ended its completion, and we could just have more fun. It was really fun just I don't know getting to know you and hearing that you do stand up comedy at the at the office. <laughs> Yeah, thank you. <laughs> awesome, thank you. So let's take another question. Our right, next one is from Joyce. Um, she asks, how are you able to keep writing? I mean, I try writing small stories that are a paragraph long and then I end up erasing the entire thing. Is there something that I'm doing wrong? Hmm. I don't think you're gonna do anything wrong. I do a lot of that myself. I think when I get stuck and I want to erase things, I was lucky in this book that I got to collaborate with Omar because whenever I got stuck, I wasn't by myself. And there were plenty of times where I didn't know what the right next part of the story should be. So I could just call Omar or text him and we could decide you know, what the next thing would be. Um, so Joyce, maybe you could try working with somebody else. Um, or just give yourself a break and take a break from your story and step back and then come back to it in a few days and see if you have a fresh take on it. Omar, right, do you have anything to add? Oh, no. That's <laughs> I want to make sure. Um, so let's take the next one. This one's for you. Um, Omar, what kept you going during your most challenging times? This one was uh, from Heidi. Okay, I am I am motivated by my uh, my beliefs. You know, we have we have every human being has their own plans, but God, the one who created all of us, has also his own plans. So once you put all your trust into God, so I I am I was moved and motivated by my faith. Also, I'm also motivated and moved by my younger brother, who was struggling more than I was. Because for me, I could communicate, my brother wasn't. 
we reached in a, in a level, in a stage where I could tell, where even when my brother looks at me, I could understand what he was asking me. If I look at him, he could understand what I was telling him. So I was really motivated by my faith, my younger brother, and also other refugees who were also struggling. In, in the book, it's somewhere we mentioned, where it, some nights where, where I dream, it wasn't only me dreaming, everyone else, everyone else was, was also dreaming in my neighbors, everybody. So I was motivated by, by also uh, other, other refugees who were also struggling alongside me. Thank you so much. <clears throat> um, our next question is kind of a good segue. So this one's from Jacob F. And he asks, um, what inspired you to write the, this book? Go ahead. Yeah. Okay. Well, it's interesting because a lot of my other books I'd started with a story I, I knew I wanted to tell. Like I knew I loved roller derby, so I wanted to write a book about roller derby. And I had a sense of what the book would look like. But with this book, I had no idea because it wasn't a story I could tell. I didn't have this story. But I, I think I started this story with um, maybe just a curiosity and a question and just a desire to know more about, you know, I started thinking about this book when the whole world was hearing about the Syrian refugee crisis. And I didn't know what to do. I didn't know how I could do anything. And I didn't know much about the situation. So I think I just started volunteering as a way to educate myself and to become more involved with my community. And so I think the book just kind of grew out of that. Um, but it was different because I didn't know what the story was going to look like. I really had to meet Omar. We really had to work together for the story to come to be. And for me, I, as Vicky said, I always wanted to write a book. That's why I have a, a memo, a, a, a rough draft. That was only meant for, uh, for our adult readers until I met uh, with Vicky who convinced me uh, and tell me, uh, help me to do this and which I was happy to do so. And, uh, the, uh, you know, I was a refugee, growing up in a refugee camp and all this, what I've been through, and also uh, getting separated from my mom and then getting re uh, reunited with her. I just wanted the, uh, the people to know who those refugees are. And I, I, it's something that I always wanted. And uh, I really thank Vicky for making, and also uh, our publishers for making this possible too. I always wanted to share my story as an educational to others who have no clue or maybe not understanding who, the, who those refugees are. Or majority of those refugees um, are children or mothers. So that's why I wanted to educate people about, about refugees. Yes, thank you. Um, so our next one is from Halima Adams. Um, she says, Salam, Omar and Victoria. Thank you for sharing your story and Omar for putting it on the page. Victoria and Omar, would you, uh, we would love updates on all the people in the book. And she says, thank you. <laughs> Go ahead, thank you. Well, you know better than I do. Why did you give the updates? <laughs> I didn't. I didn't. I didn't catch very well. Could you mind a bit? Oh, updates oh. on, on the characters. Mm -hmm. Oh, so, what are they doing now? Yeah. First, my my brother is doing well. My mom is doing well. A lot of the uh, Salantol who helped me uh, to go to school lives here in where I live in Pennsylvania, and uh, Ali also came finally. And uh, I can't catch up with, with every, every character, but the last thing I know is they're all doing well. And uh, some of them are still, unfortunately, in the refugee camp. They didn't get the opportunity to be resettled. And uh, Halima Adams, she works with casual service. I also want to thank you for working with, with refugees. Um, and some of the characters, I should say, so a lot of the characters are based on real people like Tal Salan, um, and Fatuma and Hassan, obviously. But some of the other characters, like there are two girl characters that we made up. Um, it's kind of a compilation, I guess, of characters um, that you know you knew from school. But we wanted to talk about what life is like for girls in a refugee camp. So those those two characters, Nemo and Mariam, are kind of compilations of various people. So they're, they're not actual real people. Yeah, I was wondering that as well. Thank you. 
Um, our next question is from Carolyn. So what were your favorite subjects in school growing up since school is such a big part of the book? You know, you'd be, you'd be surprised because my favorite subject was, was mathematics. And the reason being was you just need to do the calculation on, in, on the sand. You don't need a paper and a pen. And a pen. So it's uh, in the refugee camp, it's a dust. As long as you, I sit in front of my house and you, you, you just get a piece of stick and do your calculations also on the ground. So my favorite subject was always, and uh, still still is uh, mathematics was my favorite subject growing up in, in the refugee camp. That makes sense, because you also help um, refugees with their taxes too, right? Like you still do some mathematics. Yeah, yeah I, do, I do, I do prepare taxes. <laughs> That's um, really helpful. I always, I think it's not gonna be a surprise that I loved art and, reading. Art was for sure my favorite subject. Uh, my mom was an elementary school art teacher, so we always had paper and pens. My dad always brought paper home from the office for us to play with. So definitely art and English. I love to write. I love to read. I love to draw. Big surprise. <laughs> so our next one is from Jared Plummer. Um, and he asked, did you ever see your parent again after you were separated? It kind of gives it away. but. <laughs> Uh, my mom, yes, I I saw her the first time in 2017, and then I I go I went back again 2018, and I was go back again to 2019, and I want to thank my uh, my supervisor Valentina Rose for making this vacation time uh, possible when even it was so hard, so difficult to make because she knew what I was what what I was going to do. So I want to thank uh, I want to thank the opportunity to thank uh, my supervisor uh, Valentina Rose, and uh, you know I was able to go back to see my mom, and uh, now it's now it's speaking. My kids are visiting my mom, so they will be back soon. And uh, I was thinking of my mother lost me and my younger brother growing. Uh, she didn't she didn't we didn't enjoy she didn't enjoy she didn't see us grow up. So I want to give her the test of what it's like to raising your own children. So instead of since she lost me, she's now with my kids. I know I want to be with my kids every minute, every second, but I feel uh, what my mother went through uh, when she wasn't uh, when she wasn't with us. So now my kids are out there, and uh, I hope uh, to see them soon. But I saw my mom for the last three years. Each year I go back to the refugee camp. Thank you so much. It's so good to hear that she's doing so well. Um, so I think we have enough time for a few more. Um, so our next one is going to be from Diana Pagiola. Uh, and she asked, um, why did you want to be an author? Me or Vicky? Vicky, go ahead. <laughs> uh, I'll start. I guess I, I didn't know it was a job that you could have. Um, I, I visit lots of schools now, and I never had the opportunity to meet an author when I was a kid. I just didn't know it was a job you could have. I thought the library books were just appeared there or written 50 years ago. I just knew that I liked to write, and I knew, for me in particular, I liked to draw. So I think that was the big draw to becoming an author, where I could, I could choose to write a book about like pigs in the Olympics, and I could draw it. So it was really just a love of writing and a love of reading. And then eventually, as a grown up, it dawned on me that I could do this as a job. That was the best. For me, I'm more like a storyteller than an author. So I will, I just want to tell these different stories to, to different people. And uh, I really want to, and it's something that, that I, 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 I enjoyed alongside with Vicky doing this book. Yeah, I mean, so far your story is amazing. So thank you so much, <laughs> and both of you. Um, <laughs> so we'll take um, a couple more. So the next one, this is more for Victoria. Um, this one's from Pandora. Um, she asked, Victoria, how do you make lovable characters that people connect with? Just like mm -hmm. this one. Gosh, tough one. <laughs> I think what I really try and do, and I think this book's a little different because it's based on a person that I know. <laughs> Um, but I think my job in this book and in other books is to connect with the characters that either I create, like in Roller Girl, 
So no matter, none of these characters are me, but I try and put my own feelings into it. Like, how would I feel if I were, you know, if I lost my best friend? How would I feel if I had to go to a new school? So I think that's the, what I try and do at least is no matter who the character is, um, I use, I try and imagine how they would feel and I try and convey those feelings and emotions to readers so they can connect with it. So they, so no matter who it is, that readers will feel like they know them because they're like, oh, I felt alone. I felt scared. I've, I felt those same ways myself so I can understand that character in the book. Thank you. And our next question is from Evelyn Schwartz. Um, she says, I love the title. What does it mean and how did you come up with it? Mm -hmm. I had that same question as well. <clears throat> Titles are hard. <laughs> Titles are hard. I think I, at first, because I, whenever I think of any words, I think of the images, and book jackets are the hardest thing for me to draw ever. So um, when I was thinking of the title, I'm automatically thinking of the book cover. So I, I knew I wanted to have the word stars in the title, partly because the flag of Somalia is a star, one star. So I think we sort of went from there and just brainstormed a lot. And the scattered also it shows how the refugees are scattered around the world everywhere in, 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 in every country. And specifically in that refugee camp, it was like refugees scattered all, 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 over, all, all over the world. Yeah. And those refugees finally become some stars too. When they get the opportunities, they, they deserve what they need. Yeah, it really is beautiful. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. um, and we'll take one more question. So for our last question, um, this one is from uh, Donna. And she asks, can you talk about the role of the colorist Aman um, in writing this book? And what was it like working with her choosing the colors? And you mentioned the patterns. So let's hear a little bit. Uh, sure. So I mostly worked with Aman again. Hi, Aman. <laughs> uh, and it was it was really fun. It was an, a good collaboration. Um, she brought so many interesting color choices to the table. So um, there were a lot of color choices I maybe wouldn't have made. Let me see if I can find one. Things like that maybe you don't notice when you're reading it, but like a purple sky. Um, and there are scenes, maybe I'll find a, a good scene that has lots of patterns. That was one of my hardest parts as, a, as an illustrator was putting all these patterns in because a lot of the women and men are wearing very colorful fabric patterns. So that was a big part of it, choosing patterns that were then placed on the characters. Um, yeah, and she was just, Aman was just very, um, very in tune with the story and really gave me a lot of precious feedback about what the character should look like, what their skin tone should look like, um, what the clothing should look like. She was just a really integral part of the team and helping make sure it's the very best book to present to kids. So um, yeah, thank you, Aman. We really um, owe you a debt of gratitude and I'm so, so glad that you worked with us on the book. Thank you. And- um, um, And you wanna give like, one more question because I oh, love- of course. <laughs> Let's see the lucky person. Okay, so <laughs> to kind of round it out, we'll skip down to um, Logan. And Logan asks, so we'll bring it to what's happening right now. He asks, how well are you doing during the hiatus? With all of us, I assume, being inside. How well are you doing and what have you guys been up to? Uh, I'm working from home most of the time and also uh, calling, checking in with my clients. I'm doing very well. I uh, it's just now uh, social distancing, and it's something like you know when this thing is happening here. I'm worried about those who are in the refugee camp. Imagine COVID nineteen hitting those poor refugees with no medical needs and with nothing, with no supply. So I pray for them all the time. God, take the, don't take that thing from. So you know we have to keep. Uh, we have to. We have to stay inside, and we have to also stay strong and. And we will go through this. Yeah. yeah, and same with me, just been trying to stay home. Um, 
actually, maybe that's a good question to end on because when I was, you know, Omar and I are supposed to be on a book tour right now. We were going to be at Politics and Prose today and going all around the country, but, um, you know, it's not possible. And when I thought about this book and how we're kind of celebrating it from home, I mean, it's a book about finding a home and loving your family. So in some ways, it's maybe appropriate that I'm at home. I have a home. I have a family. And I'm very lucky to be able to be here spending the time with them. Part of writing this book was me realizing how fortunate I am to have a bed to sleep in and a roof over my head. So um, it's easy to be sad about the things we're missing when we're stuck here at home. But I, for one, am really, really glad that I have a home to stay in. <laughs> so. Yeah. Thank you so much. Is there anything else you'd like to share before we wrap this up? It's been, we're so thankful to have you guys here today. You want the final word, Omar? Uh, uh, the final word I will always say is, if we, are, if we keep quiet from the facts, then we, we, if, you know, one thing I always tell my clients is because they face some discrimination. Some of the discrimination they usually get is, go back to where you, where you come from. Those people who are telling, go back to where you are from, they have no knowledge of what this person has been through. So if you can say an, any nice thing, any kind thing to any refugee that you come across for the sake of this book, for the sake of me, for the sake of Vicky, say welcome, welcome to America, or it is good to be your neighbor. Anything, as little as thank you, you know, and uh, it, means, it means a lot to the refugees. Also, please charge yourself in CWS Lancaster. You can find us. You can find us on Facebook. You can also find us on, on online. Just check out the great things those people do, like any other organization. Again, thank you for your support, CWS Lancaster. Uh, thank you, and again, thank you guys so much, everyone. Thank you so much for your great questions. Um, so many other ones I didn't get to, but thank you so much for your comments. Um, and many thanks, of course, to Victoria and Omar for joining us today and sharing this amazing book. Um, and of course, thank you guys all for viewing us, uh, being with us in this format. Um, I hope you enjoyed this chat. Um, of course, don't forget to still click that shining button down there to purchase your own copy of When Stars Are Scattered. Back. <laughs> um, and you can also shop online at our store and check out Victoria's other books and other great books that tell other diverse great stories. Um, we have free shipping through tomorrow, April 15th. And you can also click up there um, to follow us, um, Politics and Prose, to check out more events um, and updated listings. You can also follow our children's and teen department on social media under at Kids and Pros, um, where we update more content as well as keep um, track of all of our great events. And I hope you can all join us again soon. Thank you again. Um, and to quote Omar and Victoria, I would love to end with saying that thank you to all the new immigrants to the US for sharing your stories with us and for making this country a richer place to live. Um, bye, everyone. Keep reading and expanding your worlds and stay safe. Thank you. And thank you so much.